So, uh, yeah, I um, wanted to get you both together because uh, on the podcast episode that we had with you, Lawrence, we did talk about the voluntary human extinction movement and that uh, there's some disagreement about your position uh, personally. And I wanted to explore that. Well, obviously, there's some there's a lot of similarities in our philosophies. But, um, yeah, I... I guess I don't know how to. Do you want to explain your um, your view on the vehement, and uh, we can go. We could explore some more about that. Yeah. Um, well, one one slight. Um, it's not a preface or a disclaimer or anything. It's like a one slight um, like add on that I just want to make or whatever before I start is that I want to make a distinction between. Um, the voluntary human extinction movement specifically and just the general idea of humans going extinct uh, on their own and sort of, you know, not um, sort of, I don't know how you may want to put it, like tampering or getting involved with sort of other species and stuff like that. Um, and the reason I want to make that distinction is because um, whilst the uh, whilst vehement is a movement, um, there are like specific people associated with it and when i sort of comment on the philosophy i don't want to seem like i'm commenting about the individual people or anything like that it's just the ideas so um uh with that sort of i mean maybe that's a caveat maybe that was the word i was looking yeah. for um but anyway so with, with, with that said um uh i can just uh lay out uh generally my my thoughts on on the topic so um, the way I see it, there are sort of there may be other things, but I the way I see it is there are sort of three basic things that are true all at the same time. Um, the first one is that um, many of the species that we share this planet with um, are sentient and possess uh, the necessary anatomy to experience pain and, and to suffer um, by and large in the same way that humans do. Um, the second thing is that the environment that these non-human animals exist in, um, in many ways, it's inextricably um, linked uh, with the causation of, of suffering. And this may be through uh, just the existence of the elements like, you know, earth, earth wind and fire, um, other life forms or other, other species like um, or other, other kingdoms more like like uh, plants, fungi, bacteria, viruses, um, and and also to each other. Non-human non animals um, harm each other as well. Uh, so that's the second thing. And then the third thing is um, if humans go extinct, uh, as far as our, as far as w we know, um, if humans go extinct, we are going to leave those two true things behind without us um until you know the heat death of the universe or some other sort of unpredicted ultimate extinction event something like that um and so my basic um position is that i have no idea how we'd go about it but i feel like it is the the duty of of humans to act as some somewhat of a um a guardian um over other species to look out for their interests and ensure that that doesn't happen and if we cause ourselves to go extinct we sort of leave the universe behind without and all the other sentient beings in it without any sort of um any other species with the sort of cognitive capacity to do that sort of moral reasoning and look out for the interests of others um so that's it in short. I mean, I could I could expand on it, but I didn't want to like take up too much time. Sure, sure, yeah, yeah. We cert we do have the uh, potential for um, caring for other species and for each other, uh, mm -hmm. unlike uh, a lot of uh, other species. But uh, I think we need to make a distinction between the lives that we are responsible for. In the lives that were already here before we evolved into Homo sapiens, like mm -hmm. uh, right now, um, sixty percent 
of the mammals on the planet um, are our livestock. Uh, and we represent 36% of the mammals. So 96% of mammals, I'm just using mammals because mammals have such a, a well-developed uh, limbic system, so they can uh, suffer emotionally as well as um, physically. So 96% of mammals uh, would not be here if we phased ourselves out and phased them out as well. Now that would leave the other 4% of um, wild mammals if they're still around by the time we go extinct, which is uh, questionable. And 70% uh, of the birds are our farmed poultry. And so uh, that 70% of uh, birds, which are suffering because of us, uh, would not exist either. So, and of course the 7.8 billion or whenever we go extinct uh, would not exist either. And, you know, we, we, we actually torture each other and uh, we kill each other at seven times the average mammal uh, killing each other for territory and mates and so on. So we're really kind of a killer ape. We do have the potential for a lot of wonderful things, but we're not, we don't seem to be on track to achieve it. And in the meantime, we are causing an extinction of perhaps a million other species, which for an ephilus, that may not be a bad thing. Uh, it's just that um, it, it's only the species that we that we randomly make go extinct. It's not like we've, uh, I don't think we could select which ones should. Well, I just said that <laughs> the non-human animals that are, that are domesticated by us, I think we should phase out, including our companion animals. Um, you know, when we're gone, they uh, won't fare as well and maybe wouldn't fit into the ecosystem. Some might, you know. So uh, the idea that I am putting forth is that if we take care of all the suffering that we are responsible for, that's a hell of a lot of suffering that will no longer exist when we go extinct. You're right. It, suffering will continue on as it did before we arrived. Hmm. Um, so the, the first thing uh, I would say is, um, I, I found it really interesting when you said that humans uh, sort of kill or, you know, hurt each other. I think it was seven or eight times the rate of uh, other species. I didn't realize it would be that low. I thought we'd be way higher. Um, yeah. I, I, in, in my mind, humans are just such a violent species. And because we go to war on such large scales, true, I thought it true. would be higher. I, yeah, I was I was amazed that it was only seven to eight um, it, it, of uh, of mammals, uh, seven oh, times okay, the mammals. average mammal. So there could be other uh, species that kill each other at a higher rate. I don't know, but okay, okay. Um, and the other thing was, um, so you were saying uh, if you know at the moment humans have sort of manipulated the environment and manipulated other species so that. You know, we've um, we've domesticated certain species and then we bred them so that they take up a large percentage of the mammals that are on Earth. Um, and, and specifically, you know, the species that have the more advanced capacity to suffer in emotional ways as well as physical ways, mm -hmm. um, which which is is true. I I, um, I used to do uh, some talks. Uh, I used to go around uh, universities and, and, and give talks, and I, I would talk about that a, a, as well. Um, and uh, but the, the 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 thing that came to my mind when I was actually giving the talks, and also it came to my mind again when when you were speaking there, is is that it is true if if humans phased ourselves out, the domesticated animals that we brought into existence would also phase out, and so you know that is less suffering. But the wild animals that remain, whilst they're four percent now, if humans, you know, cease to exist and our, you know, over time our cities and societies will, you know, crumble down, 
it will be reclaimed by nature and that 4% will eventually grow and grow and take yeah. back the land and, you know, nature will rewild itself. Right. That's right. It, it may it may never get to the point where the suffering was as intense as, say, it is on a factory farm at the moment, but n nature will begin to take over and reclaim human society and, and with that will come a lot of wild animal suffering. Um the other thing that I wanted to say as well is that um, I, I do understand uh, your point about making a distinction between um, the, the beings that we're uh, sort of directly responsible for and beings that we're maybe not directly responsible for. Um, and I think the, the distinction there is, you know, the, the beings that we brought into existence. So um yeah. you know each other but also domesticated animals mm -hmm. and then the the sort of the beings that we're not as responsible for the beings that were around um before we even came about so you know mm -hmm. wolves or bears or gazelles etc cetera, etc cetera. um and i i do understand i do understand that distinction um but at the same time whether or not you make that distinction, the two set of groups basically have the same interests. A, you know, it doesn't matter whether a a pig is domesticated, or if we go back go back way back when to when it was, you know, the species that we first manipulated it from, which I don't know the name of. Maybe it was some sort of warthog or something like that. But um, fundamentally, the the two individuals, whether wild or domestic still have the same interests um and and whilst we may not be responsible for the creation of the interests on on the part of the wild animal we still observe their interests and observe that actually their best interests aren't being served in nature and given that we are here and we have the capacity well we don't really have much capacity at the moment but in the future we can work to have more capacity to try and remedy that i feel like we have somewhat of an obligation maybe it's a somewhat of a simple analogy and maybe you'll completely blow it out of the water <laughs> but i i imagine it as if like imagine you're on a walk in a forest um and you you're you you are walking down a path and, and there's a lake and there's a child you know struggling in the lake if you're observing what's going on there and the suffering that's going on um and you have the capacity to do something about it I feel like humans are somewhat obliged, you know, if, if the child in the lake were wild animals suffering in the wild, we're somewhat obliged to go over and, and try and help as best we can the individuals that are struggling. You know, we didn't push them into the lake. They were already in the lake when we got here. But given that we observe what they're going through and we do have the capacity and we know that if we leave, no one else is going to have the capacity to save them. I feel like we're somewhat obliged to go over and at least offer as much help as we as we can um and again maybe maybe the plight and the suffering of wild animals is something that humans can't solve ultimately because at the moment it's still very much just a philosophical thing that we muse over in our armchairs sure but you know even if we can't fully solve it we can at, at least try a good good degree and i feel like um phasing humans out without first trying to address that would somewhat be a disservice to to um to ethics i would say yes i i see what you mean and um <clears throat> so we are in agreement up to a point and uh, that point is uh the difference between animals that we have brought into existence or domesticated in some cases um and animals in the wild world we are uh, causing the extinction of so many of those animals in the wild world in a sense, we are taking care of that. They don't suffer when they don't exist. But I don't think that we can understand well enough uh, ecosystems, the Earth's biosphere, and so on, in order to um, manipulate it in a proper mm -hmm. way. Uh, for example, we, we don't like suffering. We think suffering is bad. That is a human decision, and I, I think we're probably right about that. Suffering is bad. 
and we uh, should try to eliminate what we're responsible for. But pain, suffering, fear, all of these things are what drove evolution to create all of the species, the co-evolution of predator and prey. Uh, you know, the gazelle got fast because the lion got faster. And uh, it's, in some cases, the, the predator uh, becomes a super predator and is able to wipe out all their prey because they're so good at it. And of course, then they go extinct. In our case, we are a super predator that eats just about anything. So it's going to be a while before we go extinct due to a, our lack of prey. But <clears throat> I, I think we don't know enough to... Uh, decide which species, uh, how to help species, basically, what mm -hmm. wild species, I should say, uh, what's good for them. We don't even know what's good for ourselves. So I see it as a uh, a lack of, not a lack of wanting to help. We do want to help. Well, there's a lot of wildlife rehabilitation, restoration of habitat for releasing species back into the wild and, and uh that doesn't stop them from suffering. In fact, <laughs> maybe they were suffering less when they were in the rehabilitation zoo. I don't know. And uh, of course, our uh, domesticated uh, cats, when they go feral, have a very miserable life. Uh, and it's a short life, too, in addition to their predatory nature, taking care of a lot of uh, wildlife. So wherever we uh, have... Uh, I guess I could call it interfered, uh, bringing in exotic species in order to, uh, you know, bring in cane toads to eat the, the grubs in Australia and on and on. We very rarely have done it right. And I don't think that we are to the point where we could do it right. But as you say, it is philosophical. I'm never going to see the day that all humans voluntarily stop procreating. And we're never going to see the day that we can figure out a way <clears throat> to eliminate all life on Earth so that it doesn't evolve into a suffering being again. And it would require pretty much blowing up the planet because of uh, the uh, extremophiles living down in the vents of the ocean volcanoes and so on. So both of our uh, desires are impossible. So they're more philosophical. Mm. and uh, anything else mm. yeah no i i agree and it, it um it's somewhat it somewhat makes me laugh because we're both i mean maybe this is the nature of philosophy in many ways but we're both sat here talking about things that are probably never going to happen right. <laughs> yeah, at least we can try and address them in our head um yes <clears throat> mark i just saw you unmuted yourself did you did you want to say something no please keep going if you have uh Cool. Uh, yeah, yeah. I was just, I was just going to say one uh, quick thing, and and then I'll hand it over to you. Um, the only quick thing I was going to say is that um, I completely agree with Les that um, at the moment humans are completely ill-equipped to go about the task of trying to reduce wild animal suffering. There, there may be a, a few things that we would be able to do to ease it somewhat um, at the moment with our with our current um sort of knowledge and, and level of technology but i don't think to any significant degree and so i agree with less on that point um the only thing that i i would say and i'll say it quickly so that mark can talk is that um if we do put a concerted effort towards phasing just humans out we will put a full stop in the research that we could do to preventing the suffering of wild animals um and so I feel like if we if we at least try to frame our conversations towards, you know, we are against human procreation, but to a point we need to bear in mind the interests of others and research that whilst we're sort of considering the ethics of our own existence um, so that we, you know, we don't go out of existence so quickly and leave everyone else behind and maybe when i say leave everyone else behind i'm sort of framing it in my own way and it's maybe a bit un un unfair because other people see it differently but um yeah that, that that was the only thing i i um had to reply with so i didn't yeah i didn't know if mark if 
Yeah, you know, I think there are enough of us <clears throat> that we don't need to worry about go uh, if we phase ourselves out, it's going to take so long. Yeah, sure, sure. we figure it out if we're going to figure it out yeah. before we we went extinct, and maybe we'll arrive at a position that decides, well, you know, maybe we should just let uh, evolution take its course as it has, as it as it did before we came along, um, you know. Mm. No, I, I do agree that it's it. Whatever happens, it's going to take a long time for, <laughs> right. and, and unless you know there's some sort of global war or <laughs> something yeah. that comes randomly out of nowhere and causes us all to go extinct. It's it's going to take a while. Yeah. Right. Uh, so I had a, I had a question for you. The um, <clears throat> from your worldview, your perspective, do you Is see it for less or me? It's for it's for less. Okay. Can you hear me all right? Is my audio okay? Yes. Okay. Les, um, when I talk to uh, when I talk to Chris and Nina um, and other people that are kind of on the thread of environmental antinatalism, uh, the conception of nature seems to be quite different than what um, antinatalists or ethicists perceive uh, nature insofar as suffering is something that we can't fully understand, um, that it is a tool for evolution, and that there's a type of good thing that happens when uh, the environment is in a healthy state of affairs. It, what is your view on wild animal suffering, uh, the nature of being without humans? Like, do you see that as a, as a good thing that uh, if we were gone, that all these things would continue to, I don't want to poison the question too much, but mm -hmm. th th this is the kind of a point of contention, at least philosophically between what I see and what I've heard uh, some environmentalists talk about. And so I was curious about your view of, you know, the, the state of nature and, and you know, what do you see that as? Uh, yes, I see what you mean. I think, <clears throat> excuse me. I think we, uh, it, it goes back to the idea that we are not capable of um, figuring out what's best for the natural world. And wherever we go away and just leave it alone, it uh, slowly but surely uh, becomes what it was or as best it can, like Chernobyl, you know, bears come back, wild boars and so on, and a whole ecosystem uh, is developing just by our absence. And for us to look at that uh, in, and decide whether it's good or bad or shouldn't be or should not is sort of the similar to the uh, colonists uh, deciding what's best for a uh, uh, primitive, you know, so-called uncivilized people and uh, coming in and fixing their solutions uh, their their problems with our solutions. So I think it's that we don't have the um, <clears throat> what's the word for authority? I don't know if that's a, the right word. Uh, it's none of our business. I think is what I'm uh, getting at. Yeah, when it comes to responsibility or or <clears throat> what rights do we have to interfere? I can understand that, yeah. but the prescription or the de or the description of the suffering of others. So for example, if we're talking about say another human tribe that's un uninterfered, what right do we have to interfere? But I think I could make a moral judgment or at least a description of their reality if um, if they are torturing each other or if they have an unjust society or if they have, um, I feel like there are some things objectively we could say or at least uh, universalize to be able to say that this is bad. And if I extend that other animals, some animals are persons, then surely I could say that the starvation or the being eaten alive probably isn't in the interest of that animal in particular. It could be for the environment, but right. the individual, um, I think we, I could, I, without saying that I have, I, I should interfere or that I should fix it. Could I just make that descriptive claim that being eaten alive or starvation or predation or, or getting viruses or rabies or whatever um, would be a harm to that individual animal. 
Yeah, I'm sure if you ask them, they would say, yeah, I don't like having my ass eaten out while I'm still alive. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and and so to extend that to other like more wildlife suffering right so so the way that i see the environment and wildlife is that it's 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 a bigger type of factory farming in a weird way it's a it's a it's a it's a thresher of just this um carnage and gladiator war that just continues to perpetuate I am very pessimistic. I don't actually agree. I know I get guilt by association with ethicists and um, people that believe that you should intervene. I do believe that there are some environmental inter um, interventions that we have done that have helped the environment. And I think if we have sufficient um, knowledge of how some ecosystems work and there are some things that we can do to alleviate some suffering, that's fine. Um, because we're cohabitating with with certain animals, right? But at the same time, when it comes to say total extinction, it to me there's a weird uh, conflict of philosophies where antinatalists are usually seen as philosophical pessimists. But at the same time, I feel it's kind of optimistic to hope for a utopia of total annihilation by our hands. But that aside, I I sympathize with the the description of reality that this is a terrible place um and it would be better if no sentient life was here i'm not saying that we should like do anything about it because we, we would probably mess it up or make it even worse and perpetuate more suffering right but can we at least agree on that first premise that the nature of reality as it is and 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 is there any confliction of what i just said with your philosophy lawrence so what do you think about that um, Les? And yeah. Oh, so I'll let Les go first. Oh, oh um, I, I think when it comes to us deciding there are universals within the human family, we can uh, and have decided that slavery is wrong and have, uh, you know, put pressure on other groups to stop doing it. And uh, same with FGM and some other child marriages and, and these things that we as humans can say, you know, look, this is wrong. We want to put a stop to it and we'll help you put a stop to it. Uh, but I think that's a whole different realm than the natural world where we want to make sure that um, the zebra is fully dead before the lion starts eating it. Maybe we could do some genetic manipulation on lions so that they had a, a sense of whether their prey was still alive or, or not. Uh, but you know, it's, it's a, uh, Pretty far fetched. As far as us doing beneficial things for the natural world, I think all of those are us undoing what previous humans have done. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. But 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 we still have that responsibility, right? To undo. The harm. Yeah. Yes, as best we can, because you know we're pretty ignorant. <clears throat> but okay, maybe I'm I'm missing it, but like. Less your perspective of the natural world. Do you see it as a positive or or just a, a neutral stance, or do you see it as I see it as a hellish kind of existence? Oh, I don't see it as hellish. No, uh, for the most part, it's not. Uh, we like to, <clears throat> I don't know we like to, but we do notice the hellish part because that's what what is more sen we're more sensitive to, and we say, you know, the whole thing is full of suffering and so on. There is a lot of suffering in there, but there's also just a lot of uh, just basic uh, eat, excrete, mate, have fun, even in a lot of cases. So, would you say that the natural world is a net positive? No, I, I think it just it just is, okay. uh, like evolution. It just is. It, it isn't necessarily. Uh, what we could call good or bad. When when humans are gone, there will be nobody to make that distinction. Uh, and <clears throat> so that's a, a purely human thing to say it's good or bad. Mm -hmm. Okay, Lawrence, what do you what uh, do? You have any input there? Um, yeah. So you asked me an original question. Mm -hmm. I didn't know. I didn't know if I, I was supposed to respond to less first or answer your question. But you asked me an whatever. Original. Whatever you feel like. <laughs> Um, well, I guess one one quick thing I'll say uh, to Les there is um, uh, it, it is true that, you know, once humans are gone, there is no one around anymore to make that 
moral judgment as to you know whether something is a net good or not but in the same vein if you have a room of lots of tiny children um suffering in some way maybe you know they're all wearing some sort of suit with spikes on and as they you know this may sound ridiculous but as they're walking around they're poking and jabbing each other and they're in pain well as soon as the adults leave the room then there is no one in that room to make the moral judgment as to whether that situation is bad or not and so I think maybe the analogy between that and nature is is fairly obvious. So I would say just because humans have gone, you know, if humans did go extinct and the sort of moral reasoners of the universe were no longer gone, it doesn't change the state of what is actually going on in nature. And so if if we if we make the judgment now that, you know, nature is a net negative, or it is this sort of hellish existence, which I would agree with Mark, and I know you don't agree with, but if we've come to that conclusion while we exist, it still exists after we're gone. Um, and the only other maybe thing I would reply is, um, maybe this is just because of the country I've grown up in, but I would say, at least in the UK, and I would guess this is the same for other sort of more industrialized countries, is that I feel like we have more of a rose-tinted view of nature rather than rather than us uh, sort of focusing on the negatives. I think we focus on the positives. Um, as an example, mm. I'll give uh, the famous um, documentaries by David Attenborough. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would say those are rose-tinted. I don't want to say propaganda because he's not intentionally trying to do this stuff, but... It is just a rose-tinted view of reality. So if you watch his documentaries, um, there are there are he he uses nature to tell stories about winners and losers, but always focuses on the winners. And whenever there is a loser, there's a quick cut to another scene, mm -hmm. or it's quickly skimmed over. Or, you know, the person sitting watching this documentary goes, Oh, that's sad, but forgets about it five minutes later. Right. But when they go into the office the next day, they'll be telling everyone about, oh, I saw this amazing documentary last night, blah, 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 even though they've just literally witnessed a mass massacre often. Um, so I would maybe push back on that slightly, that at, at least in the country I've grown up in, people have a very rose-tinted view of, of nature, I would say. Yes, I think you're right. And uh, <clears throat> some people call it eco-porn because, uh, you, you know, it's it's only the the really sexy stuff. I, uh, mm. I've shown a lot of them in, in uh, classes, uh, and they're fascinating, but they definitely cut out anything that uh, is, you know, well, for example, uh, I saw one of a, a seabird feeding its chick a sardine, and I'm sure that during their uh, filming, one of those seabirds fed their chick a disposable lighter. And you know that's not going to get in the amazing earth things, mm -hmm. you know. And so they're they're painting a completely uh, false uh, image of what nature is like. And the camera always heads in the direction of the of the woods and not mm -hmm. turning around to get the road. So it and you're right, it, it does uh, skew people's um, view of the natural world. And and maybe I'm. Uh, thinking too along the lines of um, uh, antenatalists and, and people of our ilk who uh, do see the suffering. Uh, maybe most people don't. They imagine cute little uh, cuddly tiger cubs and so on. So that could, mm. that could be true. Yeah. Yeah. I think um, if, if you were to get an ethelist to, um, narrate a david attenborough documentary people would come away from it with a very different understanding of what had happened yeah. i remember he's he's released a new series recently called perfect world i think and he focuses on different things about the natural world and i saw one of them and i can't remember what it was to do with but there was a scene um of uh turtles had laid thousands of eggs um along this sandy embankment and you know the day came where the little i don't know what baby turtles are called maybe i do but i'm just forgetting but these baby turtles they hatch and they're going towards um 
they're going towards the water and the story was told as if um this was somehow a success story that you know against all the odds this the camera focuses on one baby turtle getting to the water mm -hmm. surrounded by dead bodies of yeah. other baby <laughs> turtles who had drowned or you know maybe they were just too weak or something like this right. and i just thought um how morally deluded is our society where we watch that mm -hmm. we, yeah you go that one turtle this is such a good thing and we just ignore all of the sort of you know carcasses lying around it um which obviously doesn't just happen um doesn't just happen for turtles there are many many species that reproduce like that right um, but you know they don't get in the spotlight in these documentaries right yeah kind of like the the hero soldier in the war you know they make it through and everybody else is dead behind them well never, yeah. <laughs> never mind about them let's give this hero a welcome but yeah, yeah. That's, that is how uh, our um, positive bias, uh, yeah, mm. uh, it, it is a skewed view of the world. Why is it bad when it happens to humans, but not bad when it happens to wild animals? Let's oh. go for less. So for example, that analogy that you used, right? Uh -huh. um, and then Lawrence used the, the turtle example. Yes. Well, if nature is having the same outcome why is why is there a difference there well we know better okay yeah they, they just uh do what they've done for hundreds of millions of years those turtles have been around since before the dinosaurs but outcome wise it it's similar right it's what outcome wise in terms of the experience it's still similar it's um, dead. <laughs> yeah okay yeah, the, the spark of life that it, that all three of us have is this exactly the same one that came from the first bacteria. And uh, if we don't procreate that spark of life that's been passed on unextinguished for billions of years, it's going to go. Tragic. Do you, do you see that as a tragic thing? <laughs> no, not at all. I think okay. it's <laughs> I like being a terminal bud on my family tree. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um okay were there any uh, other points that you wanted to address um um i maybe wanted to bring up one more thing but i didn't know it less did you have anything else you wanted to say no i don't so one one thing um that i wanted to say which was going back to um uh, uh, Les was talking about, um, you know, maybe the, the way that we um, see animals in nature and want to sort of uh, paternalize them is maybe the same way that, you know, the, the colonizer used to do to the colonized. Um, and um, I, I wanted to uh, just sort of go off, off that but make a more general point is that um, I think that analogy is not quite accurate because it's not comparing like to like because mm -hmm. if you imagine a colonizer going you know to the to be colonized group of people mm -hmm. when we imagine that group of people we imagine them to be you know they have their own way of life that they've carved out and they try to reduce their own suffering etc cetera, etc cetera. they're not particularly eat you know they're not eating themselves they probably have a stable food source, stuff like this. We have this sort of picture in, and then we see the colonizer as this sort of evil or, or maybe just um, naive paternalizer that comes along and often subjugates them, you know, because of the history of colonization, we sort of have this negative view of it. But I don't think that directly maps onto what we would be doing with animals, because at least for what I would advocate for, we would be coming at it from a completely compassionate place where all we want to do is is benefit those who we are interfering in the business of and also it's not like we would be arriving you know to this area where animals are and they would you know they would have carved out their food source and you know they you know th these these animals would not be living in the same conditions that maybe a human society that had been colonized would be these animals would be 
um, you know, being torn apart, constantly on their guard in nature. Um, many of their children would die, um, things like this. And, um, and so just to zoom out one more level, I feel like what's often useful, at least when I explain it to people, is imagine everything going on in nature and all of the sort of harms that wild animals come across. Swap all of those animals out for humans. And I think we would take the, the moral issue a lot more seriously and we would say, no, no, we actually are duty bound to go over there and help those people. I think it's the fact that because there are other species, we see it as less important. Um, but a, a, at least for me, species is not a relevant characteristic by which to disregard or, or lower anyone's um, in, interests in, in their importance. Yes, so uh, what do you think about the distinction between uh, domesticated species and uh, wild species? Do you mean in, in our duties towards them? Yeah, I guess that would be the, the main, that's the main thing I see anyway. And we're the causing the direct cause of their suffering. Mm. Yeah, so I, I, I do see that there, there is a difference because one is um, we have, you know, we have caused the suffering. The other one is we're observing the suffering. Mm -hmm. um, so with domesticated animals, um, I say, yeah, you know, we stop breeding them into existence. The right. issue goes away all mm -hmm. together. You know? With wild animals, it, it's more complicated because, you know, we're observing their suffering. We're not necessarily the cause of it, although we are the cause of some wild animal suffering True. yes we are yeah so i would say with wild animals um i i would go back to the analogy i used before is that um you know even though we may not have pushed that young child into the lake if we observe them in the lake and we have the capacity to help them then um i believe we have somewhat of, of a moral duty to to go then and, and help them i'm not sure you know, I, I've never studied philosophy or anything like that, so I can't put it in more sort of articulate terms. But um, if, if, we, if we see that child in the lake struggling and we know they're going to be struggling for a long time, even if we walk away, we should, if we have the capacity, um, go help them. And if we don't have the capacity, we should make it our duty to try and find that capacity and, and then go help them. Right. Yes, because they're they're human. We know full well what um, what they're going through, and we do have, uh, I think, a moral obligation to do something about it. So this is where the distinction. This is probably where uh, you and I have a, a difference. Uh, we we both agree we shouldn't create more uh, domesticated species like ourselves and our food animals, uh, but then you're uh, taking it one step further into the uh, wild non-human animals and I don't go that far so mm. if there was a drown if there was a drowning deer would either of you intervene I, I, well yeah I'm oh sorry Les. oh no I, I would you were gonna say that you would yeah 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 I I, I would I mean you know I I'm but wait, sure wait 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 less why would you intervene if it's not human? Like, uh, because uh, quite likely uh, we had a hand in it being in it in its drowning. Uh, in uh, in the natural world, all by itself, it probably wouldn't be uh, in uh, that lake that we created. Or uh, okay, what about okay, what about wild uh, fires? Would you say yeah. a koala or I don't know some some animal stuck in a wildfire that we didn't cause? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, the wildfires are because of us uh, controlling fires and not allowing them to run their natural course. And so now they are devastating. And yeah, we where we have interfered, like in the koala habitat, we need to try to ameliorate the situation as best we can. OK. Is there any uh, situation as a thought experiment where we did not cause the 
animal to be in that situation um, where it would suffer. For example, if they were starving, if they were thirsty, if they were, uh, if they had, I don't know, if they were struck by a poisonous, uh, if they were poisoned by a snake or something like that, or um, is there any type of distress that an animal would face where we could help? Um, or is it is it that all these situations would be human induced somehow. Yeah, you know, Komodo dragons will uh, take down a, a water buffalo and it takes about a week. And uh, it, so the water buffalo suffers tremendously. And I saw a documentary on that. I don't know if it was David Attenborough, but the people filming it were just really emotionally distraught because they knew this was what they were coming to document and it is what happens in the wild. And for them to chase off the Komodo dragon and uh, you know clean up the uh, Cape Buffalo and save its life, um, they wanted to because they really felt for that animal. Now, should they have? Of course, they would get fired. <laughs> they were there to document its death. Uh, and uh, the Komodo dragon was just doing what they've done for you know millions of years. So. Uh, that is a real dilemma. Should we interfere in that or should we not? Maybe then a Komodo dragon will die a horrible starvation if we didn't let them eat a buffalo. So when we interfere, there's ramifications we may not be clear on. But there's sometimes situations where it's just fighting, right? Like it's not for uh, eating the animal. Um, it's just a defense. Um, so if someone's fighting and then they're left to die, um, other than, say, scavengers, there's just this being that suffers for a long time, would we not have a responsibility or uh, to help out or? You mean a, a big rock to the head so they didn't suffer more? Yeah, that or whatever else we can do. Mm -hmm. I, I'm just trying to push this, this idea of responsibility um, and the distinction between helping humans but not helping non-humans. But at the same time, you already crossed the species barrier when you said helping domesticated animals. So there's a distinction between domesticated and wildlife because we are the cause of the domestication. At the right. same time, historically, dom domestication was a sort of a, a... It happened in conjunction with uh, societies. Um, it wasn't that we you know, put them in a lab and... and force bred them. Um, we do that. We force breed certain animals, yes. Um, mm -hmm. But the, his the history of domestication isn't exactly like that, right? Not yet. Oh. So if, the, if there's this type of symbiotic relation between wildlife domestication and, and our anim uh, us as animals, I'm trying to understand why we have no responsibility to wild animals. Like we I, only, I just yeah I think we only have as much responsibility as we're as we um, whenever we have interfered as I was saying uh, if if we have uh, interfered with a an ecosystem and we can try to ameliorate what we've done then yes we have an obligation to but if it's on its own I uh, you know I I don't like seeing uh, mallards uh, uh, group uh, accosting a, a female mallard, but you know, we're not gonna chase them away. Stop that, that's not nice. There's no consent. Can I, I was yeah, just go, gonna, yeah, go ahead. Um, I maybe wanted to put forward a sort of, um, because I think the the whole idea of responsibility may be the, the difference that, um, the, the maybe the difference in our thinking stems from uh, crossing the species barrier somewhat, because I know that the the distinction that I'm making, I think the distinction that Les is making is between um, the suffering that we're responsible for and the suffering we're not responsible for. Yes. Um, but I, I think that, at least as far as I understand it, I think, Les, you maybe make that distinction because they are not humans and so let me take an example but put it on in a human context and see your reaction so 
let's say we roll the clock back a few hundred years and we, you know, may, maybe even a thousand years and we get to the point where, you know, we're in a world where we're not as interconnected as we are today. And so it may be very likely that, you know, if 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 one civilization sets sails to a faraway land, they come across another civilization that they've never interacted with before. And, you know, they have no hand in how that civilization um is in its current state now if i set sail from my civilization and i have you know um you know i have food i have water i have all these things and i come across another civilization that um has has been going through an extremely bad drought over the past season i've never seen these people before i've never interacted with them i've never even been within two thousand miles of them but i come across them and their their children are dying they are suffering, you know, they're, they're becoming malnourished. Um, do I not now have a duty to share my resources with them and help them um, as much as I can? Um, because I feel like that is, is the analogy with nature is that, you know, even though there were other species that, you, you know, even though there are wild animals that, uh, you know, evolved along with us, we have no... There are many ways they suffer that we have no hand in. We didn't cause it. Right. But, you know, now that we do see it and we are aware of it and we see it and, and you know, we, we have somewhat of a capacity or we can develop a capacity to help them. Should we not do that? Just like if we found another human civilization that was suffering, we should help them. We, we would uh, be obligated to try. But I think uh, looking at the bigger picture, the moral thing to do scientific thing to do uh, would be not to do anything because, uh, okay, here's some water, uh, you know, and then the water, of course, had some pathogens that we carried from the old, uh, we were drinking out of it and we have uh, syphilis or, you know, we would inadvertently uh, spread diseases that we didn't even realize we had as, as colonizers did. Uh, mm -hmm. So our, our best intentions quite often would, um, I mean, I don't know how we could not try to help them out, right? There's, they're starving and dying of thirst. Mm -hmm. uh, but in the long run, we could easily do far more damage to those, those people, that civilization, than if we just mm -hmm. turned around and left. Is, is that not more of an argument for being considered in the way that we help them rather than not helping them at all? Uh, I'm sorry, I don't follow. So um, I, I do understand your point about the fact that, you know, um, in theory, whilst we should help them in practice, the way we carry it out may cause more harm than, than good. Yes, I, correct. I, totally, I totally agree with that. Uh -huh. But I think that is more of an argument for being considered in the way that we help them rather than just not helping them at all. And, and let me give you an example. When the Americans came across the concentration camps with the Jews and other people inside, many, many were so malnourished that when they were liberated, um, they died when they started eating food and drinking water again. Right. Would that be an argument not to help them or would that no. be an argument to, you know, do research, learn and, and develop our capacity mm -hmm. then be better suited to help? those in need rather than not help them at all sure right and and uh we do need to uh, try to fix our ignorance about um, everything but especially uh in that case if people if there was a doctor there is it wait a minute <laughs> don't do that mm -hmm. easy, easy and it's also the same with as we were talking about in the natural world we don't really know enough to actually make things better for them uh, and maybe we should learn and try to do better by them. Hmm.